Hey everyone, and thank you for joining Zweig Group Media and the Zweig Letter exclusive interview series. With almost 25 years of continuous coverage of the design industry, the Zweig Letter is a constant in an ever-changing marketplace. We are bringing you some of the best and brightest minds that our industry has to offer. Today, I am pleased to welcome George Christodoulo, attorney from the law firm Lawson & Whiteson LLP in Boston, Mass. George, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. Thank you for having me, Randy. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, you know, I've, I have been chasing down a number of pretty prominent people in the design industry um, for the past six months or so since we've been doing these interviews. And you are certainly high on the list of people that Mark and, and Chad and Jamie and others were saying, I, I definitely need to get on this interview uh, series at some point in time or another. And I, and I, you know, obviously I've known who you are since my first version of working at Zweig back in the 90s. And uh, when I got back here and I still heard your name being bantered about, I said, man, George is still around doing deals. And I thought that was kind of cool. But, um, you know, as, as, I, as, I get back, as I've gotten back into the swing of things here in the design industry over the last two years, um, I, I realized how uh, much of a, um, you know, a measured role that you have in this industry and how, how you impact it so much, even though you have nothing to do with architecture and nothing to do with engineering, but everything to do with deal making, if you will. And so I just thought, you know, it would be great to have you on board today and, and talk with you a little bit uh, about you and, and about your background and, and just, you know, how you came to play such a prominent role uh, when it comes to mergers and acquisitions in the design industry. Well, thank you. I appreciate the kind words. Uh, I, uh, back in the 80s, in the early 1980s, I was in a law firm. One of my partners at the time did defense work, professional liability defense work for architects and engineers, which was just a budding um, sort of specialty. Mm -hmm. And one of his clients wanted to buy another uh, engineering firm. And lo and behold, Mark Zweig was on the other side of that transaction negotiating uh, on behalf of the seller and I had the buyer and we came to know each other and we worked out the terms of that deal and in those days in the early 80s there was not a, a, a definitive set of books and terms and conditions for doing those. It was a very wild west kind of two engineering firms got together, two architecture firms got together, there was not a developed body of work, people didn't announce deals, they didn't know how to announce deals, they announced the deals after they were done to everybody, including the employees, it was just the Wild West. And so after we did one deal, I did a, I just happened to do a second deal, and then Mark um, asked me to help put together a PSMA, uh, Massachusetts, half-day seminar on mergers and acquisitions, a very novel concept told them no one would ever show up. That's how much I know. Mark, of course, said people would show up. They put, I think, 75 people in there that paid, paid to come to listen to this, at least cover the coffee and the donuts. And walking out, I said to Mark kind of flippantly, you know, I've got enough material here to do a book. And that was the beginning of the first book, the first m and book, which then led to the... Uh, the cookbook, the second version, and now the third version, which was published last December. Right. Which is the second version, but it's really the third version. And over that time, uh, we've seen the, the M&A uh, subset of A&E practice grow. We've seen deals now, uh, 200, 300 deals a year domestically. There's lots of... Uh, Lots of activity. People talk about the ownership transition needs and external transition. And it's come a long way since the early 1980s. But Mark very clearly was part of that, that impetus to start publishing and talking about how, how to do a deal and what do you look for in a deal. Okay. Wow. So, so now that, um, that cookbook, you want, give me the, the, the title of that cookbook that you've done, done the most recent one. Uh, the, the cookbook was the second one. Right, okay. Right, and, and the last one that came out is A Guide to Mergers and Acquisitions. Right, okay. December of 2015. Okay. Right. Is, which is the most up-to-date compendium 
and as far as I know, the most comprehensive book on the topic, and all updated with real life case studies that only only architects and engineers can share. Right. Yeah, and we'll, and we will put a uh, a link in the show notes for that so people can find out in, more information about that about that book. And and yeah, I mean, obviously, you you um, you know, speaking of which, I mean, obviously, you're an author. You, you've uh, you know you have a very storied background, I must say, and, and I, I was aware of your uh, some of the some of the your, your educational pursuits. Not to say that you didn't um, you certainly didn't put set the bar high, but you graduated from Harvard undergrad, you got your JD from Harvard, and you got your MBA from Harvard. Um, so clearly, you, you enjoyed spending some time in Cambridge for sure. Uh, eight, eight, eight years in a row, and what in, a, in about a quarter of a mile. <laughs> Wow. Hat land. Maybe it was maybe it was an acre. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, and it turns out I live four miles from there. So. Wow, that's awesome. That's awesome. So yeah, I, I spent almost seventeen years in Boston, so I know, I know what it's like. And I don't know. Just I always tell people when people say, "Oh, you, you're you're from Boston, you must be really smart." And I say, "Well, you know, there is something in the air up there. I don't know exactly what it is, but uh, there's something special about that place." Well, there are, there are a lot of smart folks walking around Cambridge and Boston and the environs, that's for sure. Right, yeah, for sure. So, well, so listen, I mean, given your entree, and, and, and I, I certainly see how, why you and Mark are so inextricably linked uh, in this industry in terms of how, you, you know, how you put deals together and how you guys got started, um, you know, why don't you just kind of tell me a little bit about, um, you know, about the differences in the M and A market over the last ten or fifteen years, and 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 where you kind of see things going in the future, because I can imagine that based on what you when when things started, how you were describing that event, and you know just your initial reaction to the people that came out versus today, what would you say are some of the big differences? Major differences today. There are there is much written about the M and A. Marketplace for architects and engineers. That subset. Uh, there are uh, the internet makes it much much easier to find out. I mean, you can go online and find out what the public company paid if you're willing to do a little digging. Right. A for the last four acquisitions and what the multiples were and what the <laughs> the going forward multiples were and what kind of employment arrangements are. And you go to conferences and seminars where these, these very buyers, and it's typically the buyers, obviously, because right. okay, are up there talking about their their uh, their template for how they like to do deals. Some do deals uh, with a fixed amount, a fixed amount up front, fixed over three years. Others do earnouts. Others are conditioned upon uh, employment. But th- there is a lot more knowledge out there for both buyers and sellers, and the sellers and the buyers are both. Both cognizant of the tax ramifications of different structures. Mm-hmm. This did not exist in the eighties, I mean, or the nineties, or even in the early two thousands. People sort of knew, but now they're they're accountants, they're transaction accountants, tax accountants that come and get involved. Uh, obviously, they're lawyers who work almost exclusively, like I do, in the A and E marketplace. That we we know all the market. Tricks of what's fair, what's not fair for non-competes. So sellers and buyers come to the table fully informed. Where that wasn't the case 15 or 20 years ago. There, it was a feeling, I believe, that that serial buyers had the the one up. They sort of knew their way around, and the the sellers were a little bit out there. Some could be taken advantage of in some ways. Might not get competent advice advisors. Today, there's so much. So much talked about. Everybody knows what's going on. People, I hear whispers. People are, you know, so and so is in the marketplace. They're looking to sell, or so and so is talking to so and so. And they go, "How did you find that out?" You know, it's, it's amazing. So I think it's a, it's a very, I would call it mature, but it's a very developed market. And the sellers, good sellers, who have good counsel. Who have good advisors, good financial advisors, good legal advisors, uh, uh, have a very level playing field because good sellers, by that I mean profitable sellers who are in in, in uh, different disciplines, in different geographic areas that are 
that are uh, wanted by buyers okay, know that there is a premium to be paid for synergistic purchases. It's not just about money. This is a people business. Okay, there are only so many good water, wastewater firms in this area of the world. And if you're one of them, you know that sooner or later somebody's going to take a run. Right. There's also a, a lot more uh, deals that are being done today with sellers who are not for sale, who are approached cold. Right. The concept that was hard, hard to get around because back previously, you sort of went to a wide, and Mark would, you know, make the calls and get the word out anonymously at first, obviously, right. that this firm would entertain being bought. Now, I can't tell you what percentage, but not an not an insubstantial percentage of deals are a buyer approaching a firm and saying, "We're looking for this kind of firm, and you fit that model, and we've identified you, and we know you're not for sale." And we know we may have to pay implicitly more, <laughs> because right. you're to stay up, but we we want to be proactive and we want to talk to you. And believe it or not, I've done a number of deals that way. So it's a much more it's a much more balanced uh, marketplace. Much is known about what pricing is like, and what terms are like, and what non competes. Uh, what the parameters of non-competes or indemnifications or employment arrangements? Yeah, it's 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 a very if you have two knowledgeable parties with knowledgeable advisors, it, it's a very sophisticated discussion, far more sophisticated than it than it used to be, and I think it will continue to be that way. Okay, all right, you know, and, and that it, it actually you you you. You caused me to go, want to go in a few different directions because I do have some thoughts about this. But I'm, you know, I'm, I'm curious what kind of advice that would you give that, you know, 55 or 60 or 65 year old engineer or architectural firm owner um, who's got a profitable firm and and you know doesn't necessarily have a real exit strategy in place or plans for retirement. What should they be thinking about from a, a, an M and A perspective if that's even an option for them? Okay, fair question. And as you know, a transition, whether it's external or internal, has been for decades a hot topic. And it's even reaching, I think, a, 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 a even a, a higher level these days because of the large number of baby boomers who are uh, at an age now whatever that is, 60, 65, 70, that own large percentages of, of firms that are now worth a substantial amount of money and perhaps even too much money to even hope that you can completely internally transition. Right. The challenge, I wrote a, a, a white paper for the AIA Trust, which was published three years ago, on that topic. And they chose the topic and asked me to write it. Okay. Because they had architects coming to them, saying, I have a nice firm, 10-person firm, 20-person firm, 30, it doesn't really matter. The ownership is in one person, two persons, three persons, <coughs> 60 to 65 years old. We go to a SWI conference, we figure out that this firm is worth X million dollars. I walk down the hall and there's no George or Randy there that are writing checks for that money. Right, right. So what would I tell those folks? I tell those folks, number one, uh, the the prevailing um, industry feeling is that by 55 years old, you need to have a plan in place. Okay. Even I believe that's really the latest because now plans take longer and longer to implement internally because of the right. just the, the sheer amount of not just money involved to transition ownership, but you also have to transition leadership. And leadership includes running the firm and bringing in the business and making sure the clients are happy and all those things that that I went to business school about, but you know, the architect or the engineer didn't go. Right. <laughs> uh, so you, you've got to think about it early, number one. Number two, 
you should strive to come up with an internal transition plan. Folks like the Zui Group does does that kind of consulting, okay? Absolutely. And start to put that in place, knowing that you don't. If you have started an internal transition, you are actually a more a more viable and a more attractive candidate for buyers because they like the fact that you're starting to spread the ownership and others are coming into the fold and that there's that there's more than just one or two folks that are the owners. So you can always sell out if you're selling in. Okay. Not selling in, you sort of have to sell out if you're yeah. on the outside. Yeah. So say start early, get professional advice from folks that that do this for a living. And okay. Talk about whether it's an internal transition or a traditional one or an ESOP or some variation of the two, or whether uh, you just decide that that just is not a viable trans uh, way to go, and you look to doing an external transition. I've heard I've heard uh, I've heard leaders and owners say, "Well, I've given up. I'm going to have to sell out." Well, that that's really not the case. It doesn't have to be the case given up, that means like this is not what I wanted to do. A, a number of folks have sold and made a compelling case that selling out was good for them and good for their folks. It gave a broader base, more career opportunity, took away sort of the precariousness of having one or two owners who may get old and you know health may come into uh, being a factor or, or being leaders there and working there and that and that Perhaps joining forces with a larger firm that could that could be more competitive in more areas geographically and in different service groups might be more attractive not just for the, the folks that work there but candidly for the for the clients of those firms. Okay. So so be, doing an external transition should not be viewed as giving up. It should be a it should be viewed as a viable alternative. Okay. All right. Well, that makes a lot of sense. I mean. And, and given outside of that whole transitional issue and, you know, again, that being a major challenge that a lot of older owners face in this industry, what are some of the other m and challenges that you see design firm owners facing today? Okay. Um, getting the level right below the, the, the large owners to either want to buy shares internally, even if they are supplemented by the firm in, in the monetary transition mm -hmm. or in if there's an external transition having that younger group I, younger it, it's typically is younger and they don't either don't own any shares or very few shares so it's not a it, it's not a materially significant monetary event if there's a sale right. wanting to embrace working for a larger firm I've heard them say, well, I was really happy here working at a 40-person firm. I don't want to work for a 3,000-person firm. My friend Randy well, worked over here, and that firm bought that, and now he's not happy. I mean, you hear a lot of that. Right. So that's so even though you may own a majority of the shares, or even a super majority, you, this is a people business. They all go home at night. <laughs> yeah, that. Exactly. So you need to get those folks. That, that's a challenge. That's a challenge for buyers. That's a challenge for internal transition. It's a challenge for the bigger owners to get that level. Um, another challenge is having owners who own a supermajority who do things their way, facing the reality that they're going to have to give up control, whether it's internally or externally. Yeah. You write about it and you can talk about it, but darn it, it's the night before closing and you go take that seller out after an all day of getting the papers ready and you sit him down and you buy him a, a glass of champagne and you say, how are you feeling? You go, I'm not so sure. I'm, I think I'm going to like my bank account, but I'm not so sure I'm going to like the next week when I come in and i got to call, you know, another city to get approval for something. Right. Okay. Right. That's a big wake-up call, I think. I always try, I try to have that discussion more than once, but certainly right before. It's not always... We typically get through, but it, it, it's a significant event. So there, uh, there's a lot of managing of people's expectations throughout this process. Well, just going, it, it, that 
you don't have my notes in front of you, but <laughs> you couldn't have done any better. Uh, poor advice. Okay. Sellers getting poor advice. Yeah. I've had something never happened to me ever, twice happened to me this year, where we had a signed letter of intent. We've had the draft documents in three turns, meaning comments and comments and comments, lawyers engaged, we're, we're talking about closing in two weeks and going to a pre-closing meeting and having the seller say they've been thinking about it and notwithstanding the fact that they're in agreement with everything that's been written, they just don't think they want to sell because they don't think the number is right. right. And they pro-offered a number that was 150 to 200 percent of the number. It wasn't 5 percent more. Right. <laughs> and I don't know who's advising them, but there's no, that's a little scary that they're getting this kind of advice so late in the game. Now maybe they didn't go out and get the advice until late in the game. Uh, but I think people have false expectations of not only just what the price but the terms and and I've heard sellers say, well I, I want to sell but I'm only going to stay for three months. And of course my answer to that is that I don't think you're going to sell because no one's going to buy you. Exactly. Okay. What you're going to do is work you're going to work full time for two years and maybe part time for a third year, but you know, no one's buying a firm and watching the name on the door walk out. Right. <laughs> so I, I put that in, in the poor advice category, just like I put a price change in the poor advice category. I mean, you got to tell a seller up front these are the rules. Once you sell, you can't compete. You're going to have to work there for a finite period of time. And you know, and this is the deal, okay? And and some sellers just, for whatever reason, don't embrace it, which is okay. Yeah. But that's a challenge. Um, and what I what I see is um, different different levels of sophistication in the advice sellers seek. I, you know, if they have a brother-in-law who's a uh, personal injury lawyer, goes down and talks to their accountant and said, well, I just sold this software company and everyone knows the software company sell for 1.5 times revenue. Well, the fact is that architecture and engineering firms do not. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you, we're laughing, but... Yeah, we, it's serious. <laughs> the, the, the most uh, entertaining is when a buyer and a seller, a prospective buyer and a seller, have had three or four meetings. Mm -hmm. They finally, somebody has to talk about, well, are we talking about one to three million or two to eight million? Because if it's one to three, we can talk, says the buyer. But if you think it's two to eight, we're not going to talk. And sometimes those two firms who get along very well talking shop are in different stratospheres. Yeah. Like, yeah. Not just by the way the purchase price, but the purchase terms and the employment terms and everything else. Yeah, so I think there's real challenges there. Yeah, it seems like it's just. I mean, it's it's almost like you're you're, you're trying to brew up this perfect storm scenario where everybody comes to agreement, and we all know that you know there there is power in agreement, but generally everybody's looking to walk away from the table with the upper hand, and I think that's the challenge. I think that's a good way of putting it. I I don't think I don't think. A good deal, there is no upper hand. Yeah, there is some things we like and some things we don't like. I think one of one of the one of the aspects that some sellers don't recognize is that they may not like what's on the table. It may not fulfill their perfect storm mm -hmm. scenario. But you know, as they get a little older and they don't have an internal plan, and maybe they get a health scare. And maybe there's some folks that have just left to go work for a competitor. You know, you know they've got to understand that they're also playing a poker game too here. Yeah, exactly, exactly. It, 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 you know, sometimes a, a sobering discussion with sellers as to alternatives. I'm not a cheerleader for doing an M&A deal. If you don't want to do the deal, and we'll move on. We'll find somebody who does. But I think I think too much. It said it's sort of like it, it's not a game where I have to beat you. It should be a game where we both have mutual respect at the, at 
at the table, especially if we're going to work together. Right, right. Well, no, that, I mean, that certainly makes sense. And, I mean, it's so funny because you kind of read my mind by answering, by in your answer, giving me a little tidbit on some of my other questions that I had, which, of course, you know, you always hear about the cousin or the brother or the uncle that's an attorney that comes in at the 11th hour to provide some sagely advice, which ends up blowing up in the face of that individual that's trying to sell their sell their company uh, because, they, you know, you have to consider the source. And I remember working in real estate a long time ago and, and learning that, you know, if you're going to, um, you know, have an attorney represent you, you need to have someone that knows about real estate represent you from that perspective, because there is specialization within the legal field of, of, uh, of attorneys. And you want to make sure that you have the right person at, in your corner at all times throughout these delicate business exchanges. Uh, clearly so. And, um, I, asked, I asked the general counsel of a very large publicly held firm that does numerous transactions every year, what, with whom I've done half a dozen transactions coincidentally mm -hmm. over the years. Asked, what is your greatest fear when you start out discussing a letter of intent, a seriousness, you know, that you're going to move forward? And they say the greatest fear is that the advisors on the other side don't know, are, are, are first of all, not business lawyers or, or good business advisors, but are there because of other reasons. And secondly, that if they are business lawyers or business advisors, that they need to have an experience and expertise in the architecture, engineering, environmental consulting segment sector, and not just be deal people. Right. Because there are so many, if you read through the mergers and acquisition, a guide to mergers and acquisition, you talk a lot about how certain terms of a deal here among architects and engineers are very different than buying a firm that has hard assets. Right. Here, all the assets go home in fact. Yeah. That means we have to have we have to have employment agreements, maybe retention payments for younger folks. We have to have non-competes. We have to have indemnifications because most firms don't. The only assets most A&E firms have are a substantial amount of receivables, some WIP, and some personal property, furniture, fixtures, and equipment that have probably been written off to virtually nothing. Right. <laughs> Right, right. It's, they're not a lot of hard assets when I buy a firm. So if folks don't stay there and work, what am I really buying? I'm buying that. Aren't I buying that group of folks working together? Exactly, exactly. So I go further than just saying you need a business lawyer or a good business advisor. I think you need a good, a good advisor, okay, whether it's financial or legal, who ha knows, knows the A and E industry and understands uh, what's fair market terms right right yeah and you know and, and, and you know we'll, we'll close out with this and I'm glad you mentioned that because this this kind of brings home another point and and obviously at Zweig here obviously we, we consult in a number of different areas within the design industry and we, you know I work in the recruiting and executive search area and, and one of the things that I'm always telling our client firms is that you know if you if you have a very well adjusted staff that that enjoys what they're doing i got to imagine that 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 bodes well for someone that's in the market to try to sell because maybe that will present better to the buying public when it comes to a, a merger or acquisition without question without question you know a good place to work voted you know one of the better places to work right I find we find some smaller sellers are paying above average compensation. Hmm. Okay, and you wonder whether that's a little bit of combat pay for right. <laughs> this the kind of player or is this place a sweatshop? I mean, you start to wonder, right? right exactly, exactly, exactly. Because everyone's got to sort of fit into that buyer's matrix at the end of the day. Okay, okay, yeah. Well, that makes sense. Well, listen, real quickly before we close out, I mean, just. Any any really cool war story you could share? Just uh, just something you know, really short and to the point, but something that for the audience might be a, a real good aha story that 
provides a, a very valuable piece of, uh, of, of lesson, a le- very valuable lesson or insight that will help save somebody some money down the road by making, but instead of making a bad decision. Okay, uh, I, obviously I've got a lot of war stories. One, one that I'm fond of telling is years ago, I actually think through Mark, I got introduced to a firm and we spent a lot of time preparing. Uh, we were, they were buying, they were in the architecture sector. And uh, we prepared the documentation, and we all flew into the city the first time I met these folks, and they had their accountant, and they had uh, myself, and we got together, and we had dinner, and we said, okay, we're going to start tomorrow. Uh, I said, fine, 7.30 in the morning, because I'm used to working with architects and engineers. They said, well, actually, no, 9 o'clock, so you should go to the gym. I went like, really? You flew me in here? And we're going to start at nine o'clock. So we start at nine o'clock, and they and the seller has the biggest law firm in the state. They have their M and A person. They have uh, in those days it was a uh, someone from a, uh, a big eight accounting firm yep. for the big four. They had uh, another financial advisor, and we go through all the all the documents. The employment agreement, the purchase agreement, the agenda, everything. So we all shake and said, okay, I'll go back. We'll turn a draft in four days and we'll be, you know, we're talking about closing in whatever, two months. So we get in the the rental car. This is the CFO, the CEO, their outside accountant, and myself. And we're driving to the airport and it's quiet. And it's too quiet. And I say to my client, um, everything okay? I said, no, you were fine. You were just right. You you were compromising when you should have been compromising, but you were stern when you should have been stern. You served, saved us from being the bad guys. But just to let you know, when you get back to Boston, it would appreciate you closing up the file and sending up your final bill. And I said, well, that sounds like I just got fired, right? <laughs> Well, remember, you only met with us at 9 o'clock? Well, at 7 o'clock, we had breakfast with the owner and his number two, number three, number four, and number five person. We're not buying this firm. Wow. Wow. He said, the owner is great. He's in his 60s. He's got some health issues. But there's no way flying 1,500 miles away and buying a firm that the, their number two, number three, number four, and number five are going to run this firm. Wow. That, it's not a deal anecdote so much as it's like, remember, it's a people business. Yeah. And <laughs> that's all you're getting. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't even a worry that two, three, four, and five won't stay. It was like, even if they do stay, they're not. <laughs> it's just not going to work. <laughs> so, so an admonition up front to understand why the firm is selling if you're a buyer. Yeah. And maybe if you're a seller, to come straight out and talk about that because, you know, today buyers can figure that out. But, you know, it's not that hard. Yeah, absolutely. And and with social media and everything else, it just seems oh, yeah. like there's just a, but, a panacea of information out there that you can tap into to, to gain some additional insight before you make a final deal. You can you can Google these firms. You can Google the people that work that lead these firms. You can find out so much more today without yeah. ever leaving your office. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, man, that's perfect. I, that was a great story. That, I think we'll we'll go ahead and end with that. So so listen, I'm, we're going to go ahead and close out. And um, folks, as a reminder, all Zwei Group media programs like this one are available free for download on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and YouTube, just to name a few places. Also, we'd like to thank you for watching this in video format or listening to the podcast by offering you a free copy of the Zweig Letter. Just visit info.zweiggroup.com forward slash free TZL and a link to all of this information will be in our show notes, including uh, George's email. George, may I, can I share your email? Um, Absolutely. Yeah, in case somebody watching this decides they know they need to reach out to a real uh, design industry M&A attorney 
Um, so I'll, I'll get your, your email. Um, you want to just tell it to me real quick? Sure. It's G. Christodulo, my okay. last name. Yep. At L A W S O N, Austin dash Weitzen, W E I T Z E N dot com. Okay. Everybody, I know you got that, but in case you didn't, I will start, certainly stick that in the show notes uh, and make sure that you have a way of reaching out to George. He has worked uh, intimately with uh, Zwei Group uh, for many years to do a lot of deals. And so, you know, he certainly is the deal maker in this industry, and we figured we'd bring the best to you. So, George, thank you so much. Um, for for sharing time this afternoon, you're on vacation, but you took time to uh, just to stop and speak with us for a few minutes, and we really appreciate that. And we also look forward to seeing you at Hot Firm in a couple of weeks in Phoenix, Arizona, on uh, September 22nd and 23rd. Well, thank you for reaching out, and thanks for taking the time and and having me on. Thank you so much, Randy. Not a problem. And now, if you're in a really giving mood, feel free to share this link with a friend. It's kind of like spreading the love and the knowledge all wrapped up in one. I'm Randy Wilburn, and you've been listening to Zwei Group Media, part of Zwei Group. We exist to make you more successful. Bye for now.